everybody. Welcome to my Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Sally Foote. Today I'm going to talk about how pain and anxiety uh, run together. That we can see both pain and building or increasing signs of anxiety and also aggression and compulsion in animals when the two are happening at the same time. Recently there was an article published in today's veterinary practice with um, information and also, uh, you know, kind of what is the state right now for veterinarians, especially in general practice, to be able to evaluate not only pain when we know or suspect that there is an animal that's had, you know, hit by a car or an acute, an acute injury, but especially when there may be that kind of low level grade of body inflammation and it's not that obvious. You know, the signs of pain are not extremely obvious. So um, what I wanted to cover with them was how pain can increase anxiety and, and or aggression and compulsion, and then some of the tools that we have, you know, right now that we can use. Um, first of all, to start with, we want to understand, we need to understand what's changing in the body when an animal has, uh, especially low-grade chronic pain, and higher pain or more acute pain. This would be things like, yes, a hit by car or a sudden uh, inflammation in the skin, like a hot spot, um, something like diarrhea, or inflammation of the bowels. That can cause pain that's gonna happen and rapidly increase, so we call that acute pain. And in that acute pain, there's a release in the body of different um, endorphins, is one term for them, or biochemicals, chemicals from the brain and the nervous system to naturally help decrease the sensation of it. So in, if the pain only is going to naturally last a few days, like the worst, you know, bruising from say a, a getting hit or falling out of a tree, that and then healing happens, then the amount of those um, biochemicals is not completely depleted from the body. Now, of course, some animals given brought in for care, we give them medication, we give them pain relief medication that speeds up the process of helping to decrease that draining down, if you will, of the endorphins. And so the body can self-replenish it. So in acute or sudden pain, yes, there will be some increased anxiety. And I think it's also easy for many uh, doctors and veterinarians and veterinary staff to assume like, okay, be careful with that animal it's just hit by a car. They may try to bite you because they're in pain. It's obvious. They're holding their body close. They may be crying. You know, they're not moving. And so we know and we anticipate that that animal may possibly bite or lunge up and be aggressive, or is gonna be cowering and shivering, maybe showing signs of that I don't wanna be touched, you know, those anxiety signs in acute pain. Now, the where we tend to miss it and where it's not been as well um, promoted, but now is being more promoted to learn about the impact of like low level or chronic pain, this what's called maladaptive pain and how it changes the behavior of the animal. And a lot of that change can, true, can be because of the changes that are happening, more permanent changes of these neurotransmitters in the body. Serotonin is an important chemical in the brain for mood and for calming, but it is also a very important chemical for that natural um, reduction, you know, and, and decrease of pain sensation and how fast your body perceives pain. So when an animal, say like a cat, and many of our cats are over the age of eight or nine, have arthritis in the elbow or the lower lumbar spine, with every day they're kind of feeling a little bit of that body ache, and by the end of the day from moving around, this achiness is increasing. The serotonin in their brain and their body is getting like drained out, trying to help decrease the feeling of that so they can get up on their perch and they can get in and out of the litter box, and they can, you know, get to the food dish and eat. And over time, that depletion of the serotonin is a part of why then they become more sensitive to touch. And this is called allodynia, or that you're anticipating more pain than what you might normally feel, or you actually do feel more pain, like from just light touch, than what would be considered, what would be normal, and thusly, the animal withdraws or tries to avoid. So now you have cats and dogs who are ducking, like a little dog like this, 
if he had a disc disease in his back of his neck that was kind of on and off and on and off, that's more of that chronic pain. And someone reached to pet him and now he ducks or he pulls away, that's the sign of anxiety. He's not limping, he's not crying, he's not holding his leg up, that's high level of pain or what we see in acute pain. But this ducking and pulling away or someone reaches and then he bites the hand because he is going to aggression to say, stop petting me. It's related to the pain. It's, the pain is a trigger for this. So getting, how do we figure this out, right? So it's really important that we start to incorporate or think about not only uh, what, what the animal's body language is like and how it matches with some of our pain scales, but also to pay attention to is the animal showing signs of anxiety, aggression, or even compulsion? We're starting to find some evidence where some of the spinning and chronic granulomas looking on the chin, spinning around after the tail, or sucking on objects is also related to uh, or, or caused by a source of, say, intestinal pain in the area, or maybe even some tingling sensation, you know, painful sensation in the skin. So the tools that we can use, there are a couple different, um, sorry, there are a couple different charts. And uh, the ones that, at least if we can all start in one place, we can start to talk in a common language for when, when the veterinarian, not only when the veterinary staff is doing their examination or hospitalization, to every day evaluate not only pain, but also anxiety level or aggression, the behavior, but to help our clients to do the same. Uh, this, we do not have any one, just one universally accepted, um, you know, pain scale. There's ones called the Glasgow scale. I have some here from Colorado State University, and there are a couple of others. And there's, some have been validated, meaning uh, if they've been, you know, used in different scenarios and had other experts, you know, cross compare results, et cetera, et cetera. So right now we don't have any one pain scoring system or chart that every veterinary staff is using uh, for evaluation. So it kind of makes it a little hard that we're not all using the same universal language if we say, oh, he's a level three or he's a level five. And um, then that, that we'll probably, we'll get to there, you know, we'll get there down the road. So at the very first though, if we can start with us all using easy and simple to use references that we can all quickly look to in our general practices because the majority of practices that are seeing this low level chronic pain that's what's in the middle-aged pet you know the elderly pet um, is going to be the general practice because many of our clients may not be reporting to us the dog who now instead of jumping straight up on the couch puts his front paws up kind of wiggles on and then uh, brings the legs over that's what the dog does when they're having early back problem, but he gets up on the couch. So the client may just see like, oh, he gets up on the couch, he must be fine. And so we're not told, and we don't think maybe to ask, is, there, is he getting up and down off the couch in a different way? So here's a couple of handouts that can really help us all with kind of gaining that, you know, universal language, if you will, that we're all speaking about behavior and speaking about judging the body language of pain in a similar way. Now, um, so the first one, you've, you've seen me use these before. Uh, let's all talk about body, the body language of behavior in the same terms, that we're going to utilize a graphic image like this. Sorry, I'm in front of my face. <laughs> this is the body language of fear from uh, Cattle Dog Publishing it's still available at drsophiaian.com. You go under the shop and then you can um, follow the whatever links for downloading this poster and you can go ahead and get this poster. Now you can also buy it and to hand it out to your clients, shelters, you can hand it out to the shelters, but we want our clients to have this hanging up in the home. So when they see them looking like any of these signs, they can say, oh, I guess he's really not really feeling his best about that, he's a little timid about that, or a little unsure about this, so we can catch it early. Now again, the second handout, which I also think all of our clients should have, in addition to all of our practices having posted up, this one is the Ladder of Aggression from Dr. Kendall Shepard. 
And this one, you can see those same signs of yawning, turning the head away, walking away, standing crouched with the tail tucked under. But it helps you to match what you see on this chart to high, how, how high up on the scale are we. So that also helps then to tell the veterinarian, like, well, he's halfway up the chart because he stands crouched with his tail tucked under whenever the two-year-old goes running up to him to give him a big hug. So now I can understand how upset, nervous the dog is getting, and then also how likely, you know, how close are we to possibly turning to aggression, which is very important. So let's use these, these uh, handouts. So we're all referring to the same descriptions and we're getting an accurate language. So this is for the dog, that there. And then this is my ladder of aggression for cats. This is available at my website, drsallyjfoot.com. Go into the veterinary resources and you can download this for free. And again, it shows a similar body language, the ears flicking, eyes dilated, uh, hair raised over the back, hiding, you know, and how the cat goes up. And we can match that with this uh, physical, you know, graphic. So we can recognize what the cat looks like when they're say, this is a cat crouching, or this is the cat with his ears turned back and his brows furrowed. So that way we can recognize it and then also know how high up on the scale is this cat so we can get better reporting back to the veterinary staff. And when we ask, we can point to those charts on the wall and our client will be, oh yeah, that is what he looks like and they're accustomed to seeing it. Okay, so these are available, they're out there. Go to my website, go to the Dr. Safian website, they're free, you can get them. Now the other handout you're gonna to wanna to add into this, uh, which I, I gave out actually fairly often to my clients with aging pets, this is the Colorado scale, Colorado State University's pain scale. Now, while this pain scale does have its limitations, it's primarily talking about what the animal's body looks like. It is not also incorporating anything like blood pressure or heart rate. Those are important things to also monitor or uh, put together. You know, think about when we're doing an exam as to evaluating for pain or anxiety. Yet, at least if we start at a simple point that if we're going to, when we're going to think about, hmm, might this animal be painful? Is it pain or is it anxiety or is it both? That we go at least to this scale because it's easy to refer to, it's easy to read, you can give this to your client. Now this is the cat scale, they have one for the cat. And they also have one for the dog. You can download these from the Colorado State University website. Just type into Google, feline pain scale, CSU, that stands for Colorado State University. And then you'll pop you up to the PDF and you can print it off. But it's a five point scale and it shows a dog just kind of sitting here still, maybe ears mildly back. That would be a very minimal amount of pain or discomfort. All the way down to, of course, a dog who is laying on his side and extremely in pain. But like this yellow zone here, this yellow zone says, um, droopy ears, worried facial expression, arched eyebrows, darting eyes, reluctant to respond when beckoned. I mean, they don't wanna get up, they don't wanna move closer to you. Well, that is the same thing as, similar to the yellow zone here. Standing crouched with the tail tucked under. Creeping ears back or walking away. Walking away or if they're away, they don't wanna come close. That's what that means. So really, you know, the color levels of the pain scale do correspond with the color levels of the canine aggression scale. And if we look at the cat scale now, we have lays curled tuck for our yellow zone here because we have that same blue zone, which is uh, comfortable with resting, you know, maybe curious, but the yellow zone, the yellow zone is where a lot of things are missed. We do, people don't realize, and even veterinary staff may not, but this is where we can help. The yellow zone is where the cat is. De decreased responsiveness, seek solitude, that's hiding. Or they're laying under the bed, they're laying up on the cat tree for eight hours and they don't get down. Uh, lays curled up or sits tucked under all four feet under the body, shoulders hunched, head held slightly lower than the shoulders, 
tail curled tightly around the body. Okay, that is the same as the number, sorry, six or seven here. Now we're in that yellow orange zone of body hunched down, head down, and hiding. So the, again, the pain scale color band, you know, the gradation matches with the ladder of aggression in the cat as well. And so, and then of course the descriptions, you can then go to your graphics here, okay? So these are three handouts that it is a starting point can really help with daily evaluation when the animal's hospitalized or even in an exam room. If we're not sure, oh, is it pain or is it fear? You know, honestly, it's usually both because of the change in the neurotransmitters with pain. Remember that serotonin is going down, adrenaline is going up, cortisol is going up. Those are the same biochemical changes that are happening with those emotional changes of fear, anxiety, then leading to aggression or compulsion. So I do a presentation, it's called No Pain, No Maim. And in that presentation, I give a lot of, uh, I talk about this topic, first of all. And I think one thing that kind of gets to be a little bit of a dilemma or maybe a, I have to figure out which one it is, you know, situation, is for the veterinarian especially to, because then we, we want to categorize things, okay? We always want to like kind of put everything in straightforward, simple categories. This animal is painful or this animal is anxious. Is it a medical problem or is it a behavior problem? Honestly, more often than not, it's the two together. That the body and the brain are always working together. We have to have both a healthy body and a healthy brain in order to have really a good welfare. And so this article in today's veterinary practice, um, I linked it in my Facebook post, I believe it was yesterday. I hope everybody reads it because it's a really good one for helping us to open our eyes to this as well as giving the links and references to some of the um, different scoring handouts and also acknowledging that we need a simple way to refer, like a simple scoring system to refer to, to help make it easy to do this regularly and ex you know continue to grow with this uh, knowledge base. But getting back to the idea of which is it, pain or fear or both, here's how when I realized and learned more about behavior and started going, you know what, there's a lot of association with pain and learned more about that from people like Dr. Gary Landsberg and Dr. Roland Tripp was that, oh, well, wait a minute, here's the beauty of it and the simplicity of it. It doesn't really make that big of a difference for me to absolutely know which one it is. If with whatever I am doing to improve the physical health of this animal or behavioral health of this animal, it is also addressing or preventing any kind of chronic or low grade pain, I'm gonna take care of both because that's what's in the best interest of the animal. And we do not have many definitive diagnostic tools for things like say that just early smoldering arthritis. You have not had the bony changes yet to show on the x-ray. They are not going to have big changes in any kind of white blood cell count or uh, other biochemical markers, you know, one might find in a chemistry or thyroid level. You know, that's when things get more advanced, okay? So this the early, the early progression that if we keep our head stuck in, well, I have to see bony changes on the x-ray in order to say, yes, it's arthritis, then therefore I will treat it, we are gonna harm more animals. So uh, as Dr. Daniel Scott has said, if it doesn't harm an animal to go ahead and use a medication and see what response to this therapy there is, then we should use it. And that is true, response to therapy is in a sense a diagnostic tool. So when we are faced with middle-aged animals, we not only need to think about um, how can we you know, accommodate the home and the environment so it's easy for them to get around and also change some of our, maybe modify some of our typical behavior modification plans such as rather than asking the dog to sit, we may just reward this older dog for standing still, not jumping up. We should also think of, we should also put this, you know, think of or put this dog on, maybe a joint supplement, maybe a supplement for helping to reduce the effects of brain aging. Because even though he isn't showing signs of cognitive dysfunction syndrome yet, 
that might be a part of what's going on with him and why he's now whining more or looking at his leg more, etc. The drug classes of, uh, or the specific drugs, I should say, tramadol increases serotonin. It is a narcotic. It does reduce uh, pain, but it also does increase serotonin. So it can actually be, it is actually a good choice when you have an elderly patient with some early uh, pain as a part of pain and anxiety relief. Gabapentin, that's another medication, wonderful for pain relief because it works in a different pathway. It also decreases anxiety because it facilitates how the serotonin uh, goes into the brain cells for utilization and it also is working on the GABA receptors to help kind of just slow down the effect of adrenaline and so on on the brain while it is also decreasing that sensitivity to touch and the transmission up um, the sensory neural pathways from touch and other stimulation. So it's giving you both that benefit of pain relief and anxiety relief. Um, other medications, uh, or excuse me, supplements that can also be very helpful are, as I said, like the omega-3 fatty acid supplementation because they help to decrease body inflammation, improve circulation to all of the tissue, and also can stabilize the brain cell membrane for utilizing the dopamine serotonin that is there. So these are just some of the um, tips or ideas on how to approach this. And I think lastly is we need to help encourage our clients to tell us more about the day-to-day -day habits of their pets and how they may be changing, especially in cats, because on a physical examination, it, uh, it can be difficult to see that twitching of the muscle, you know, when you're, when you're palpating down the back of the dog, if you're, you know, we're doing our palpation down the lumbar spine, if when you touch an area that might have inflammation, you know, you'll see that fasciculation of the muscle, and it may be very mild, very little fasciculation with mild inflammation, but that's still significant as compared to when you touch it, then they wanna bite you, which is significant pain. But because the dog's body is larger and the muscle mass and it's just there is larger, it can be easier for us to see it. We also, there's some thought also on the difference in the social makeup cats are more solitary. They uh, may not want to interact so much with humans, so therefore may do just a heck of a lot more avoiding and with their their body just doesn't want to show the pain as much as a self-protective thing as compared to the dog. So on the dog, if you pick up small amounts, definitely significant. We can tend to pick up when the dog is painful on exams. For cat, it's a lot more challenging, even with the best hands of people. My friends who are the chiropractors and acupuncturists are the best at detecting small and slight differences in the cat and in um, detecting that, but that's because they're so experienced being a chiropractor on the palpation. For the rest of us, we're not gonna feel it. So what we really need to hear from the owner is, not just is your cat getting on the counter, because they'll get up on the counter, but are they hitchhiking to get up on the counter? And the hitchhiking is the cat who is on the floor, looks up at the counter, mm -hmm. oh, there is the top of the garbage can I can get onto. So he taps on the top of the garbage can. And then he sees, uh, and then there's the bar stool. I can get on the bar stool seat. Ah, uh, now I can get on the counter. So the cat was going on three levels to get up to the counter instead of floor right to the counter. Well, he's getting on the three levels because it's a lot harder on his back to go from sit up and really power up to the counter. Our, so therefore, the way we ask our clients to, to describe how the cat gets on the counter, how does your cat get up on a cat tree, or it, he's not getting on the cat tree, yeah, he doesn't feel like it anymore. Okay, well, why doesn't he feel like it? It's usually because of pain. So getting, we need to hear from the client, how much are they playing? How are they playing? Are they changing how they play? Are they changing how long the dog wants to go on a walk? Is he quitting after 10 or 15 minutes? We need to hear this, not just, is he going on a walk? So I think, our, the way we ask is going to be important. And one last thing too, I will say that really, really helps to screen for this is a telemedicine consult with your clients or telehealth is where you use someone like myself, where I can do, I can look at them, I can evaluate them, I can 
give advice, and then I give that report back to you, the primary care veterinarian, who can then go on with giving the joint medication, et cetera, and we work together that way. If you cannot, don't have the time, or you know, just embracing telemedicine now isn't the time to try to get into this technology. But that ability to see how the animal moves in the house how, and what the house is set up like really does so much to help us with um, early chronic pain in our dogs and our cats to screen for that, to address that, as well as for behavior problems. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming today. Um, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'll be posting this up on the YouTube channel in addition to Facebook. Uh, I will be speaking at the Illinois State Veterinary Medical Association Conference. It's all gonna be online like everything is right now. <laughs> Sorry, I really wish I could be live. I will be doing the Feline Handling Lab on Sunday, November 15th live. That'll be like live TV, real live live stream from here, the Bella Behavior Learning Center in Tuscola. And I will have a low stress handling certified handler with me. I'm going to see if maybe I can get one other uh, or two volunteers to be with us to learn. And we'll, you know, stay safe at six feet apart. But this way on a live meeting, you can have, we'll have the chat box open, the ability for you to directly ask questions, to see a repeated, um, step I do or to ask me to demonstrate things, you know, or modifications for whatever you have to deal with at your office. Go to isvma.org and go under, uh, I think it's the events page and you can register for the convention and get your continuing education that way. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.